well. As you're doing that, um, I'm gonna catch you up for those of you maybe who missed last week. We have started a new series here at Expression called The Great Rebuild. And we are looking at the life of Nehemiah. I have, we have just felt that, that there is, this is like a prophetic book for us that God wants to speak to us through this. And so we began this last week by jumping in with a story of Nehemiah. And if you're not familiar um, with Nehemiah's story in the Bible, you know, Nehemiah faced a really big challenge in his day. The thing that he loved, the promises of God, the, the city of God was broken down. The walls were destroyed. And um, in this, he had to really make a choice. Was he going to leave his place of comfort? Was he going to leave his, his, you know, his own personal um, position? And was he going to step in and be the one to rebuild? Was he going to you know, go after his dream or God's dream? And so we began talking about the story of, of Nehemiah last week. And, and um, you know, so many of us, I think, can find ourselves right now, especially after the year we've had, the pandemic, the race stuff, the politics, the church stuff. We can find ourselves in a similar situation as Nehemiah, where we're looking around and we're saying, there are some things laying in rubble right now in our culture in our country, in our government, in our churches, in our family, in our business, in our health, whatever it is, there is some rubble, some things that are precious to God. And, and so as we're diving into this, I want you to be thinking about how this relates to us. Um, because I love what I love about this story. You know, as Nehemiah really shows us that God uses ordinary people, right, to become the great rebuilders. Um, you know, some people may just want to sit and hope, cross their fingers, wish it changes, sweep things under the rug, and others will truly get in the ring, press in for heaven's strategy, have faith that God can use them, even though they're an ordinary person, and they will watch God do something that is so much bigger than they could have ever done in their own strength. And so this is who we are, family. We are a wild group of people who believe that God uses us for great things. And so um, I I'm going to kind of just catch you up if you missed last week, kind of what we talked about. Um, and we're going to jump into to Nehemiah chapter 3 in a moment. Um, but our story takes place somewhere around 444 before Christ. Um, the people of God um, had been exiled out of Jerusalem for like 150 plus years at this point. Nehemiah is a man who is serving under King Artaxerxes in what formerly was Babylon, but was taken over by the Medo-Persians. And so when the Medo-Persians took over Babylon, where the Jews had been exiled to, um, they, there was a decree that was given that the Jews could go home. They could go back to their birthplace, but it had been, you know, a long time. And so many of these people, including Nehemiah, they were born into captivity. This is all they knew. And so in Nehemiah's day, um, a group of, of men had gone to inspect what was happening in Jerusalem. And they came back with a report. They came back with a report that the city was destroyed, that the walls were decimated, that the gates were burnt down, that the people of God, there was mixture. And it was just an awful, awful situation and on hearing this report, Nehemiah is heartbroken and he weeps and he fasts and he prays and he pours his heart out before the Lord because he was heartbroken for something that God, it was God's dream. Nehemiah didn't know these people, right? This was God's dream. And so he spends four months just in intercession and, and this holy prophetic lament um, about the condition of the people of God, about the condition of Jerusalem, God's city. And uh, in a moment of favor, he goes before the king and he asks, asks to be granted um, the ability to go and rebuild the city of God, to go and rebuild. And, you know, Nehemiah had this comfortable life in a palace, but he risked everything. He walked away from it to go and pursue what was important to God. He gave his life for a cause that was bigger than himself. And, you know, I love that um, what an invitation for all of us, right? To give ourselves to what matters to God, to, to be willing to step out of our own comfort, to go after what God is building. And so, um, you know, this is kind of the moment. So it, basically what happens in this story 
is, um, you know, he, he begins the journey. He begins the, the journey back to Jerusalem to examine, to see what's happening, and, and to, to call the people of God to join him in rebuilding the wall. And, you know, although this is, you know, the Bible is a human book, right? And it's, it's written by, by humans in their own language and culture. The Bible is also a divine book, right? And so it's written by God and every word and every story that's put there is part of a bigger arc, a bigger story that God is telling. It's like these moments in history, right? These, these stories, but they tell a bigger story. And, you know, we really see that with Nehemiah, that Nehemiah is pointing to God's bigger story, um, that another Nehemiah, was coming. Another Nehemiah who would leave his palace, who would leave the, the comfort of, of the palace to come and intervene on behalf of the people of God, who would come and rebuild, who would give himself um, to rebuild what was important to God. And so we knew that, we know this story points to Jesus. Um, but I, we're going to drop in today into Nehemiah chapter 3. So, you know, like I said, Nehemiah has now gotten back to Jerusalem. He's examined the walls. He sees the disaster. There's opposition. It's messy. And he begins to, to organize and strategize and, and mobilize the people to help rebuild the wall. Now, I'm going to read part of Nehemiah chapter 3. Disclaimer. This is probably one of the most underwhelming passages, chapters in scripture, and you will see why. And I'm probably going to butcher 90% of it. So just hang with me because there's a purpose to this. All right. So Nehemiah chapter three, here we go. Then Eliashab, the high priest and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the tower of the hundred, which was dedicated and the tower of Hananel. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them and beyond them as um, was Zakur, son of Imri. The fish gate was built by the sons of Hanasseh. They laid the beam, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Merimoth, son of Uriah, the grandson of Hazak, repaired the next section of the wall. And beside him were Meshulam, son of Ber Berechiah, the grandson of Meshezabel, and then Zadok, son of Banna. Next were the people from Tekoa, though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. Interesting note, right? The old city gate was repaired by um, Joida, son of Peish, and Meshulam, son of Besodiah. They laid the beam, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Next to them were Melatiah from Gibeon, Jaden from um, Maranoth, people from Gibeon, and people from Mizpah, the headquarters of the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River. Next was Uziel, son of um, Herahiah, a goldsmith by trade, who also worked on the wall. Beyond him was Hananiah, a manufacturer of perfumes. They left out a section of Jerusalem as they built the broad wall. Rephiah, son of Hur, the leader of half the district of Jerusalem, was next to them on the wall. Next, Jediah, son of Haramath, repaired the wall across from his own, ha own house. And next to him was Hattush, son of Hashabaniah. Then came Malkilijah, son of Haram, and Hasab, son of Parath Moab, who repaired another section of the wall on the Tower of the Ovens. Shalom, son of Haranesh, and his daughters, come on, daughters, and his daughters repaired the next se section. He was the leader of the the other half of the district of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to stop there. This entire chapter is this. Then this person, and next to him was this person, and next to them was this person, and next to them was this person. This whole chapter lists out the names and the families of the people who rebuilt the city of God, who rebuilt the walls. On and on it goes, right? Now, I love this chapter, I love that these names are put here. Why? Because every name matters. Every effort matters. And, you know, every contribution was huge. It was so important. And I, you see in this passage, if you keep reading the chapter, you have men and women working together, parents and children, clergy and laity working together right? You have working groups from different towns, groups from different classes. You have the ruling class and the working class. You have different trades. You have goldsmiths and merchants and perfumers and gatekeepers, which are kind of like police for, of the day. Everybody's working together. Every part of society, a very, very diverse group of people, and they are working together. And I love that you'll see this over and over if you read the whole chapter. 
next, you'll hear these, these three words, next to him, next to him, and next to him, and next to him, right? That is the, that is the arc of this whole chapter. That is the message here. And um, I love that, next to him. You know, I love this picture because the dreams and the heart of God can only happen when we all take our place on the wall. The things we're longing to rebuild can only happen when we choose to learn to stand next to him, right? And work together, put our efforts together. Um, It it causes us to not be self-focused. I love this. Everybody took their place. There was no separation. It wasn't like just the, the, the ministers or the priests doing it. It was everybody, everybody, shoulder to shoulder, all powerful, all, all contributing. You know, something way bigger than all of them was built. And it was birthed, birthed from this place of next to him. I stood next to him. You know, the Bible tells us that one can put a thousand to flight. And two can put 10,000 to flight. But I've been wondering lately, what if this isn't just about individual people? What if this is also about ethnicities and culture, right? What if, you know, groups, what if one culture can put 1,000 to flight, but together two can put 10,000 to flight? One thing I love about this church is we have over 60 ethnicities in this church. That's incredible. Imagine the impact of our togetherness when we all take our place on the wall, when we all start really building together, when our men and our women are powerful and our our young and our old, right? When everybody truly takes their place next to him, next to him. The reality is our impact, the impact that we will have in our life, what we are able to, to how we advance the kingdom of God, what we, were able to, uh, what we will be able to build is really directly related to our togetherness, right? Our togetherness. My breakthrough is your breakthrough. Your breakthrough is my breakthrough. You and I choosing to link arms and build together creates synergy. Now, synergy is the combined power of a group of things, That when they're working together, it's greater than the total power achieved by each working separately. Synergy is, imagine everybody in in expression just killing it in their individual lives. I mean, just living at 100%, right? Doing their very best, but they're in their, everybody's in their individual space, going after their thing individually, killing it. If we all did that, we'd, we'd get here. But what what scripture invites us into and what synergy explains is that when we all link together, we all link together, we are intentional and purposeful about my momentum affecting your momentum, your momentum affecting my momentum. When we are strategic and intentional and we link together, even if we're not operating at 100%, what we're gonna be able to do is up here, synergy, right? Our togetherness creates an exponential Um, force. Togetherness allows us to do something we could never, ever, ever achieve by ourselves. All of us working independently by ourselves. There's power in our togetherness. You know, I think about um, what was said about our early spiritual fathers, right? I think about what was said about the the early church. In Acts 17, 6, they were dragged before the rulers of their day. And this is what was said of them. These who have turned the world upside down. These, them, they. It wasn't an individual. There was never an individual. It was they, them, the community, the followers together. These are the ones who've turned the world upside down. They did it. They put Jesus on display to the whole world because they did it together. You know, the reality is Nehemiah couldn't have done it alone. He could have not built that whole whole wall by himself. Change and transformation was only possible through closely working with other believers. Everybody took their place on the wall. And they weren't working in the same section either, right? They each had a designated section that only they could build. Each one was valuable. Each one was needed. It required all hands on deck. 
We're on a mission here at Expression to build something that is bigger, bigger and more powerful than any of us could ever build on our own. Do you remember what happened at Babel, right? God had to confuse the language of the people um, because their togetherness made them unstoppable and they didn't have God's agenda, right? Um, Genesis 11.6 says, look, he said, the people are united and they speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Look, the people are united and they're speaking the same language. Dang, nothing is gonna be impossible for them. Unity is a game changer. Unity is the game changer. Us being united, family, creates a world where nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them, where that becomes the reality. Now, I am not gonna sit here and tell you that unity is easy, because it's not, right? It is not easy, it's costly even, but my goodness, it is so worth it. You know, the, the prayer Jesus prayed for us in John 17 is this. My prayer is not for them alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so they may be brought to complete unity. You know, many times, especially when talking about unity, and building together, um, a lot of our fears come rushing in. Fear that we're gonna have to give up something um, of ourselves or fear that we'll have to you know, tone down our, our you know, authentic self somehow um, or lose part of our culture or, um, yeah, that there's, we, we fear that so often or we bring in hurts from our past. We bring in times where we got hurt you know, in covenant relationships. We got hurt from in, in, in a community. And, you know, while it's true in, in community and in family that there are, you know, everybody does have to adjust for each other and everybody does sacrifice for each other um, and we learn from each other and we'll all change, it doesn't mean we sacrifice who we are and it doesn't mean we have to sacrifice what we bring to the table. You know, recently, a um, couple weeks ago, we took our kids to go see my grandparents, who are amazing and adorable. They're in their 90s. They live in the Bay Area. And we have not seen them in a long time, you know, and especially through the pandemic, we've just been careful to not visit them. And, um, but they were, you know, really longing for us to visit. So we took a lot of precautions and, and went to go see them. And um, after our time with them, you know, we thought, okay, we're in the Bay Area. We're going to take a couple days and just have some time to be out of L.A. for a second and um, explore and things. And, um, you know, all my kids, I have three kids. Each kid had different things they wanted to do. My kids are 15, 12, and 10. They each had different things they wanted to do. You know, my daughter wanted to go to Hate Street in San Francisco and do some, you know, funky vintage thrift store shopping and record shops. And, and Josiah, my middle one, wanted to find a cool sneaker shop. And, and Rua thinks all that's dumb and is like, is there an aquarium open? Is there a zoo somewhere? You know, and um, all I wanted was some blue bottle coffee. I mean, is that too much to ask? Right. So we all had things that we wanted or things that we were hoping to do, you know, needs, if you will. I think needs a little strong word, but uh, the coffee was probably the only need really there. Um, but in the middle of this, right, um, everybody kind of makes sacrifices for each other, right? So, so we spend an afternoon going into San Francisco and we're walking around Hate Street and it's not Rua's vibe, but he's, you know, we keep him snacks and try to distract him. And, and he, you know, he rides it out because he knows it's important to his sister, right? And then there's a sneaker shop and, and we're all waiting because Hona and Josiah are in there like trying on sneakers, right? And we do that. It's not my ideal. Do I want to spend money on sneakers? No, right? <laughs> I don't want some kids asking me for $200 for a pair of sneakers. So I don't want to do that. But you know what? We ride it out because it's family and that's what you do. You make adjustments for each other. Of course, there's no zoos or aquariums open with the pandemic. So we, you know, took an extra long drive down a country road with lots of sheep and miniature horses, you know, for Rua. 
Did Malika think that that road with no internet, you know, or Wi-Fi was, was awesome? No, but we do it, right? Because that's what family does. And so um, I think it's important to understand that. Like when you're in family, you make, you make sacrifices for each other, but the benefit of family far outweighs the adjustments we have to make for each other. Now, just as an example, if, um, if going into the sneaker shop, say Honan and Josiah went into the sneaker shop and had a great experience, but Malika and I followed them in and, and we were met by, I don't know, just say some really like abusive behavior, like, you know, whatever, really mistreated in there or degraded being women or something like that. As our family, Hon and Josiah would be like, whoa, that's unacceptable, right? Family wouldn't just say, whatever, they treat me fine, too bad for you. You, you know, you can wait outside. Like, family also stands up for each other, right? So f- there's, when you think about the church as a family dynamic, these are things we think about when we're talking about unity, right? And so, um, yes, we make sacrifices at the same time. We don't sacrifice who we are, and we also stand up for each other, and we also make space for each other. Um, Everybody really has to be willing to give uh, and contribute to really see the full blessing of family. And I, I've been thinking a lot about this. You guys, it is not an accident that we're here. It's not an accident that you're here, that you're a part of this community. Whether you are physically in, in LA County or you are you know, joining us from online, it is not an accident. God brings people together for a supernatural divine purpose. Christianity isn't consumerism. It's not you just come, you take a drink, thanks, I'm gonna go live my life. Like we are a body, right? We are meant to run together. There's things that, that we have that will help unlock each other, that will help, you know, our togetherness. We will be able to advance the kingdom in a profound way. It's actually us coming under the lordship of Christ. And this unlocks the promise we just read in John 17, so the world may believe. See, there's, this is the promise of unity. Jesus is praying that we're one so that the world may believe. That is revival. That is a move of God. That puts Jesus on display. You and I choosing each other and not getting up just because it's easier to do it our own way, just because it's easier to be in our own echo chamber. Us choosing each other, right, puts Jesus on display. It makes the world hungry for who Jesus is. Unity has a very powerful promise attached to it. You know, it's not surprising to me that the enemy has gone so hard um, trying to bring division, trying to break down unity in our churches, in our families, in our nation, um, trying to provoke people to walk away from people, you know, spiritual community that God actually intended them to run with because they're offended about politics or walking away just because it's easier to do it yourself or easier to be surrounded with people who think just like you. The sad thing is the church in this country, in in America, is one of the most, if not the most, segregated institutions in this country. Our togetherness is a catastrophic threat to the enemy. God is building a family where every part matters. Each part being active and valuable and powerful is necessary. It is vital. 1 Corinthians, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting uh, in verse 12, it says, Just as the human body is one, so it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. For by one spirit, we all were immersed and mingled into one single body. And no matter our status, whether we are Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. In fact, the human body is not one single part, but rather many parts mingled into one. So if the foot were to say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it's forgetting that it is still a vital part of the body. And if the ear were to say, well, since I'm not an eye, I'm not really a part of the body, it's forgetting that it is still an important part of the body. Think of it this way. If the whole body were just an eyeball, how could it hear sounds? And if the whole body were just an ear, how could it smell different fragrances? But God has carefully designed each member, listen, God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. I love this, verse 19, a diversity 
is required. Diversity is required for real unity, okay? And diversity is required for if the body consisted of one single part, there wouldn't be a body at all. So now we see that there are many differing parts and functions, but one body. Now, of course, we can say this about the Big C Church, but we can also say this about, you know, our own church. Diversity is important. We're not all meant to look the same and worship the same and sound the same and have the same church culture and have the same whatever. We're not all trying to be the same. We bring all of who we are, all of our uniqueness and our diversity to the table and we all surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we all value and honor each other. We all make space for each other. We all adjust, we all learn from each other, but it is, it is about putting Christ supreme and us uniting together. Next to him, next to him, next to him. We need each other. Your voice, your, few, your view, how you see the world, you know, your experiences are so necessary to this body and to the body of Christ. You are powerful here. And we also get to let other people who see the world differently than us be powerful here. It's how the body works. Diversity is required. It's also our greatest strength. The body of Christ is a diverse group of people unified and working together. So I love this. Um, when you think about the body of Christ as a body, as a family, right? Even though we're so different, I think about the fact that I can't escape myself from that. Even if, you know, it's, it, God is not coming back for a black bride, a white bride, a Korean bride, a Chinese bride. He's coming back for one bride, right? He's not coming back for the male bride and the female bride. He's not coming back for the older people, you know, bride, the millennial bride, the children's bride. We're all one part of the body. We're all his bride, right? Why would we ever want to function with only part of the body? We need both hands to build something. We need both eyes to see clearly, right? We need all the organs functioning together. Diversity isn't just like something to kind of out there, oh, that's kind of nice. No, diversity is vital in the body of Christ. I also love in this story um, that everybody built up their part that was near their house right? Which to me is like, just start where you are. Start with what's in front of you. Start with, with what you're passionate about. Link arms and start building there. And I, I also think about this. If you would have asked anybody in Nehemiah's day as they're building, all these people building this wall, what they were doing, they would have all given you the same answer. If you asked a person on the northern side, right, what they were doing, they would have said, we're building the wall of Jerusalem so that God's people can come and worship without fear, and so that God's purposes can be carried out because Messiah will come to Jerusalem. They weren't just saying, hey, I'm building this wall because it's going to protect my house. Right? They understood that they were building something bigger than them. Do we understand that we're building something bigger than us? The reality is the people that were building, they were not skilled wall builders. I mean, they're perfumers, right? And merchants and whatever. Like, these weren't skilled craftsmen. They were just willing and available. Nehemiah knew he could not do this on his own. He had to come with diverse input. He needed all the perspectives to really see this built. He was a cupbearer. He didn't have experience. He wasn't a construction worker, right? He, he was a cupbearer. But as he allowed this input, as he, as he sought God for strategy, he began to, to share the vision to the people and vision leaks. Communicating vision is so important. Do we even understand what we're doing? Do we even, you know, are we, are we all speaking the same language? Do we know what we're building? The reality is we have to assume some of these people didn't get along. We know that there was a lot of mixture and a lot of issues and a lot of sin in the camp. So the fact that these people, you know, I, I don't envision that this was just this like, oh, we just all love each other. No, I doubt it. 
This was like full on anarchy, survival of the fittest out there. You know, this was crazy town. This is Lord of the Flies, Jerusalem, right? So uh, imagine, I'm sure there was a lot of issues, but the people understood that, that the call of God was too great. The stakes were too high. The invitation too powerful to let petty things or, or past offenses get in the way, right? They could not let themselves get in the way of what God was building. They built something powerful together. And, you know, it stands out to me, the one little passage thrown in there in verse 5 where it says, um, and next to them, the t- t- Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. Or, you know, whichever translation you're reading, they, the nobles wouldn't do it. They, their nobles wouldn't put their shoulders in it. Interesting. All the people who did named, but also named those who refused to participate. Those who thought they were too good. Those who refused to, to, to link together with others. And I think it's good for us to stop and ask ourselves, you know, is there a reason because it points usually to something deeper going on. Is there a reason I'm not all in? Is there a reason I haven't been all in with a church community for, you know, three years? Is there a reason, my, you know, is there, is there a hurt, an offense I need, to, I need to work on because this has gone on too long. This is, this is like driving me. This is keeping me away from, from contributing and building together and, and really experiencing family and unity. I need to get healed of this. Or maybe it's just a season or maybe whatever. There's, there's a lot of reasons, but I think it's good to stop in these moments and look at what is that. So if it's something that needs to be healed or tweaked or aligned in us, we let God do that, right? Because so that we don't miss out on what God is doing. And I'm not downplaying, hear me with that, I'm not downplaying those hurts, because those are real. I'm not downplaying, you know, things that have caused you maybe to feel that way. I'm just saying, if it is stolen, you know, and, and so much from you already, let's get that healed so it doesn't continue to steal from you, right? Let's get that healed. Let's, let's allow God to really heal that so that you can fully be seen and known and celebrated where God has you. So there's this progression in the Bible um, where you have these figures, right? So originally you have like David or Moses and they're really kind of operating as one. There's not a lot of team effort. It's kind of just the one man of God, right? And this picture we're seeing here with Nehemiah is a totally different scenario. We're watching something completely different. You know, scholars talk about this dynamic happening here is, is very different from what we've seen up to this moment in scripture, This is something the clergy couldn't do. This is something the prophets couldn't do. This required the clergy, the prophets, the laymen, the merchant, the daughters, the sons, everybody to be shoulder to shoulder for this to happen. Such a picture. Everybody taking their place. There's another progression that we see in scripture. First, God comes down like at Bethel, right? And he meets with Jacob. He'd come down and then he was gone. We'd see that in scripture. There's moments where God would come down and, you know, encounter Moses or something. And then he's gone, right? The presence is gone. And and then there was a time in scripture where we see his holiness come, you know, um, fill the temple. And his presence is now in a physical location, right? God's holiness, his Shekinah glory, it dwelled in in a physical location, And then now we see the next phase. We see the next phase of redemption. We see now that, that, you know, this concept that the people of God now carry the presence. It's the people together. It's the body together that we are being built up, right? Um, 1 Peter 2, 5, come and be his living stones who are continually being assembled into a sanctuary for God. Come and be his living stones. You and I, the people of God, the family, the body, we become the temple. It's not about God coming and going. It's not about a physical location. It is now about a community who carries the presence. The city could not be rebuilt. Israel would not have become who Israel was supposed to be unless everybody took their place. Everybody had a key role to play. In the same way, Paul said over and over, every one of you have gifts that work together for a greater purpose. You know, in this story, these people all had different gifts and strengths, levels of experience, but they all put their hand to the same thing. If God in his providence has brought us together as one church expression, 
one community. None of it, the none of it is by accident. You are so valuable. The peace you bring is so valuable. We need each other. We can't get up from the table of relationship because we see things differently. We need each other. Diversity is required to do this incredible work God is inviting us to do. The reality is there are certain people only you can minister to. There are certain perspectives you have to bring because of your experience that need to be heard. There are certain, you know, hands only you can hold. There are certain people, certain hearts that can only be healed through relationship with you as you become that safe, loving person for them, right? We all have a powerful part to play. Our togetherness is our greatest strength. When I think about this passage, and that, you know, next week we'll, we'll get more into this, but I think about this passage, I think how incredible that God invites us. Nehemiah is a story of this, but this is true for us. God invites us to build something, right? that outlives us. What are we building that's gonna outlive us? What are you building that will outlive you? You see, when you build with a community, you build up the walls, you build up things that have legacy. You build things that will outlive all of us. I want my kids to look at what we build and say, wow, our parents took a stand against injustice and they built some walls to stop those things from happening. Wow, our parents, they built up a a safe and healthy church that we could grow up in so that we could encounter God and not have to deal with the same hurts they had experienced growing up in church. Wow, wow, our parents built up a community so full of faith that I just thought it was normal to see miracles and the supernatural and God do crazy things. That was just our culture. What a legacy, right? We get to do that together, but we can only do it together. We can only do it together. There's no way. It's about God's dream, right? It's about God's vision. Nehemiah was building God's vision. This church, Expression 58, is not about Hona and my vision. This is about God's vision. It's about what we're going after together. Everybody standing shoulder to shoulder powerfully to see God's kingdom advance, to see God's dream established. You know what our our, our vision statement is, expression? Expression 58 exists to be a city on a hill that beholds Jesus and puts his brilliance on display. We aim to live the gospel in such a manner that we inspire personal faith, cultural renewal, and societal transformation. Putting Jesus on display, that's what we exist for. We exist to be a city not an individual, a city on a hill, united together, diverse, powerful, all of us, taking our place, holding our lights together, putting Jesus on display, to live the gospel in a way that inspires personal faith, cultural renewal, and societal transformation. How are we doing that? What are we building? What are, what's our wall we're building? What are we building in 2021? What what are we doing together? How are we doing that? How are we putting Jesus on display? We're building an authentic, vibrant, healthy, multicultural church that makes Jesus supreme. It's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and is committed to the undiluted gospel. And that means we're willing to examine and uproot any place mixture tries to creep in. We're building walls of legacy in our city, in LA County. We will see reform in our foster care system. We will see reform in our criminal justice system. We will see solutions for our homeless population. We will see transformation in the entertainment industry. We are building walls of legacy in LA County. We're creating a well together, a portal, an environment where people can experience the presence of God and be transformed by his love, right? Can encounter God. You pull on him, I pull on him together. You know, we create a well, a a pool where people can come in LA or online and experience God. We're building up people, lives, 
from our youngest to our oldest, right? We're building up people to truly know God, to experience God for themselves, to experience freedom and healing. We're building a community that takes radical steps of faith, that's innovative and creative and bold, right? That is launched into different industries and spheres of society. We are together building a community. Your stories inspire me, my stories inspire you. Together we are creating a powerful faith-filled community. Together we're building a culture of honor and love. To love people radically, no matter what their life looks like. We're saying, hey, the church is open to whoever is hungry, right? We're building, a, we're rebranding and redefining even maybe what, what, what people think church is in this country. We're saying, no, it's marked by love, come in. We will love you, you are welcome here. We wanna to introduce to you and, and sur to our God and surround you with love and community and validate you even if your life looks really different than mine. We're building kingdom justice with Jesus, solutions, transformation. We're building families, marriages, children, right? We're building together. This community is actively building in a lot of areas. We are building up the city of God. We are building the kingdom of God in Los Angeles. We're building, even outside of Los Angeles, many of you watching are coming from all over. But we are building and we have an assignment to build and to rebuild some things that have been broken down in culture, in our nation, in the church. There's some, sham some things laying in shambles around us and we're on a mission to rebuild, but we're gonna do it together. We understand that our togetherness is our greatest strength and we can't afford to not do it together. That together we create synergy that can't be stopped. May it be said of us expression, nothing they set out to do was impossible for them. Nothing they set out to do was impossible for them. Why? Because the Deaconsons built next to the Ramirez's, right? And Next to them was the Prizzies, and next to them was LaRonda, and next to them was Everett and Marina, and next to them were the Clyborne sisters, and next to them was the Hunter family, and next to them was the Collisons, and then the Cottons, and next to them was Karen, and Peter, and Tori, and Felicia, and Mindy, and Jewel, right? And next to them were the Racinos, and next to them were the Patty Lucos, and next to them were the Webbs, and then next to them were the Butchers, and next to them were the Howards, and the Dansons, and Shauna, and the Sedgestines, and Rena. And next to them were Kalila, and Sarah, and Jessica, and, and Natasha. And next to them were the Butler brothers. And next to them were the, you know, the Dahlgren sisters. And next to them were the Millhouses. Come on, put your name in the comment section. Let's go. And next to them were the Steagles. And next to them were the Grillos. And next to them were the Oxners and the Lancasters. And next to them were the Bridgers. And next to them was Ellis, right? And next to them was Matt and Sarah. Next to them was the Cassicas. Come on, put your name in the com comment section. And next to them was you. Next to them was the Toledos. Put your name in there. Build with us. Say, I'm here. I'm building. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I want to rebuild something. I don't want to stand around and just see some of the rubble we're seeing and just say, oh, well, I know we can do this. I know God has called us. I'm in. Next to them was me, and next to them was me. Family, I have so much stirring in my spirit that God is inviting us into. I truly believe that whatever we set our heart to, we're gonna see happen. But we can't do it alone. We're gonna do it together. Next to him, next to him. This is about God's vision. This is about all of us taking our place, standing shoulder to shoulder to see God's dream come to pass. Listen, Nehemiah, we're jumping into this. This is a prophetic word for our church. This is a prophetic word for our church. In our culture, in our nation, in our country, you know, in the Big C Church and, and in E58, God is inviting us all to take our place. It is time to take your place on the wall, to show up powerfully, to make space for your neighbor to be powerful. 
even if they're different than you, and to partner to build something that is so much greater than all of us. Father, I pray, I pray, God, I pray for us that you would help us to be one as you are one. Lord, I am hungry to see the world believe because Jesus gets put on display. I pray, God, that this would be the season for anybody who's felt a little bit on the outskirts, for anybody who's, who's been afraid to fully dive in or, or even been afraid of, of a, a very diverse multicultural church. Lord, I pray, Lord, for healing. I pray, Lord, for courage. I pray that we would take our place, that we would value our brothers and our sisters on either side, that we would refuse to do it any other way, that we would link arms. And that we wouldn't walk away, God, when, we, when, when we're not getting our way, Lord, or when it feels hard. But God, that we would say, we are building something so much bigger than us. God, we ask that your kingdom would come. Lord, that your will would be done on earth, in L.A. County, on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I pray for every person, every person that's watching, every person that is called to be powerful, every person you're inviting to, to truly take their place and link together with the people you are putting around them and you're calling them to run with. Father, I thank you. We bless you. We invite you, God, just to, to lead and to be supreme in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Expression, we love you. I want to encourage you, keep reading through Nehemiah. We'll be in chapter four next week. Have an incredible week. Thank you.